Today I'm going to do a practical application video on fire management and uh, show you kind of the real basics in managing your, your wood fire or your charcoal fire in an offset smoker. This is a small offset porch smoker I'll be using. It's an old Oklahoma Joe's. They used to make them out of really thick steel back in the 80s and 90s. And um, I bought this one and refurbished it. That's what we'll be using for this example today. It works the same on a trailer smoker. It works the same on a direct heat smoker, really. Uh, you got to follow the principles of making sure you have as complete a burning wood as possible so that, again, we get those kind of oils uh, present in the smoke that we really want, and we don't have all those other uh, oils and chemicals in the smoke that come with an incomplete burn, like I've said over and over and over. Uh, so let's get started. This won't be a real, a real long video. Um, while I was shooting this video, I decided, of course, I don't want an empty smoker. So I am going to cook some beef ribs and some bologna and some polo sausage, just uh, as the example goes on here. So this is the offset smoker. Notice it's very thick steel. I bought this one for maybe 150 bucks somewhere. Uh, I think if that's this one. This one might have be, been given to me by some friends. So I have several of these. Uh, and then you take a wire wheel to it and spray paint it with uh, some of that smoker paint that you can buy at Walmart. And they look great and they work great. Best if you keep them you know, under the porch or in the garage or something like that. But you can leave them outside. So I'm starting with the charcoal chimney full of charcoal. This is Royal Oak charcoal, which I love. I like it as much as I like Kingsford, if not better. And they do tell you everything that's in it. Uh, which is something that I require of a, of a charcoal if I'm going to use it. And I like to go ahead and stack some of these small pieces of wood on top to get them burning. Uh, what we want is a complete burn, and when wood first catches, it's not completely burning. I'll show you some examples of that. And I'm just using charcoal lighter fluid. Uh, and it burns completely off. I don't think it adds any off flavors or anything like that, as long as you let it really, really get hot and completely, completely burning. Um, and so, you know, I start out with a charcoal chimney, like I said. Throw some chunks of wood on top to get them going. I let this process take at least an hour. I really want it to get burning really, really, really hot uh, during my smoke. So I start this way before I'm ready to start cooking. Uh, and if we were to dump all this out in there right now, which I did as an example, look how pillowy and white that smoke is. That's what I call dirty smoke. That wood has not had a chance to completely get caught yet. It's just caught on the outsides. So a lot of that wood isn't burning with a hot enough temperature to turn it into clean smoke. And we'll just keep going here. I, I did several little examples here to show you, but that's what I call dirty smoke. Now look at that. And this is, this is 30 minutes later or so, and this is really burnt down almost to coal. And when we shut the lid in this case, uh, I'll show you here. You can almost not even see the smoke. This is actually what we're looking for. You can see a light ribbon of blue smoke coming out of there, uh, and it won't be a problem. As we pan down to the door here in a minute, you'll see some of that coming out. But see how light blue it is? It's not dirty smoke. Okay, so I've opened it back up now. I take pan release like this, just the cheap stuff, any vegetable oil will work, and I always coat the inside of my smoker on my grate. That will polymerize on there and season those grates and make it a little bit non-stick, but mainly it just seals it off from uh, rusting and things like that. I do it uh, every time I cook because the stuff's really cheap. So that's kind of my next step. And now we've got the temperature up. Everything's up and high. We're probably going to need to add some more wood real quick to make sure we have enough temperature to carry us. And that's going to be a little bit dirty smoke when you first add wood. So we'll add that on there and let it get hot and let that dirty smoke turn into clean smoke. And while we're doing that, we'll further prep our meats. You see our temperature is just perfect there. There's Josie back there monitoring things. But see that nice little thin blue smoke? That's what we want. All right, there's the beef plate ribs. We trimmed these in a different video. You'll recognize them. Uh, there's some bologna we cut and scored and a little bit of Polish sausage. Uh, and of course, Josie looking for scraps. I'm going to use my own dry rub on this one. Uh, with beef, I usually don't add a lot of sugar, so this one is mainly salt, garlic, uh, onion powder, coriander, things like that in it. I don't like a lot of sugar on my on my beef products, uh, but I do like a good heavy salty dry rub like this. And you could put this on a lot uh, earlier than I do and let it 
uh, kind of soak in a little bit. The spices and seasonings, um, just as a matter of, of, of fact, the spices and the seasonings, the flavor from them will not go deep, deep, deep into that meat. Uh, you can get you can get flavors deeper in your meat by injecting them and, and physically placing them in there with an injector needle. But what will happen with a spice rub like that is the salt can move through those those membranes. Uh, there's we'll we'll talk maybe in another video when I go into dry rubs about osmosis and what we learned in high school and college chemistry about hypotonic versus hypertonic solutions and how salt can move across semi-permeable membranes. The point is salt can move towards the, the center of that meat. This is how we get hams and brined products that are cured. Those salts could move. So if you decide to dry rub it really early, uh, what you will be getting out of that is some salinity in the center of your product. But your spices and your flavors, in my opinion, do not move towards the center of that meat at all, just the salt. So that's just kind of a side note. A lot of people talk about, should I dry rub it, you know, 24 hours before and let it sit as a dry brine? You can do that. Just watch your salt content. If it's too salty, it will get saltier. So that's, I, I never mind, uh, you're dry rubbing right before I, I put it on. You're not going to taste that big of a difference. This is actually kind of difficult to do with a camera in your hand, but I like to put a uh, a good rub on the outside of my bologna also. You don't have to. Bologna is already salted and it's already cooked, but this adds a neat crust that we'll see later that I really appreciate. Uh, of course, it's been scored there. You can see uh, I think I have another video where uh, that'll come out that has, you know, prepping sausages and bologna and things like that. And I like to score them like this so that they can open up and not break open whenever they start to expand in the smoker. And it looks nice. Also gives some more valleys for smoke adhesion, which is good. <laughs> so there we have prepped our bologna and we have prepped our beef ribs. And our smoker is where it needs to be. These are those big plate ribs that we trimmed. You can see the table I have there has everything ready for it. It is so nice to have a good work surface. All right, so that polar sausage has been on about an hour, and as you can see here, it is done. It was done when it went on. It's pre-cooked, but the smoke has now adhered to the outside, and the thin, nice blue smoke has adhered to the outside, and they've cooked up to a higher temperature. It really helps the flavor of, of products like uh, bratwurst or polar sausage if you smoke them further, even if they're pre-cooked when you buy them. Now you can see here, there's starting to be some crust formation on here. That, that, that rusty red color from my dry uh, rub that I put on there in the seasoning is starting to get darker, and we're starting to see some adhesion in those smoke oils on there. But if I were to take the back of my fingernail and rub it across this bologna or this plate rib right now, that dry rub would definitely rub off because it's only been about an hour. And it takes several hours for all this crust to set on there. And until that happens, you want to leave it alone and let that solidify on there. A dry cooking environment like this offset smoker provides does uh, quicken and hasten that, that bark and, and pellicle formation that, that adds to a good set bark. Um, but in a minute, I think the next shot we see, the crust is set, so it's several hours later. I'm still being shepherded. And you can see the mahogany color of that product. <clears throat> so this is our fire's burning down a little bit. I like to open the firebox so the smoke doesn't just kill me when I'm in here working. You can see here now the crust is set. And this is the test. You just scratch it with your fingernail. See how it didn't come off? Now it is safe to spray it with a wet mop. So the wet mop, uh, you know, I go, I kind of go on and on about not wanting a, a moist cook environment with a lot of steam and water and water pans and things like that. That's because until this point, the reason we've gotten really good syringol and glycol oils collecting out of the smoke onto a good strong pellicle that's formed a crusty bark that's not going to wipe off. The reason we've gotten all that, in my opinion, is because we've had a good convective hot drying environment with good clean smoke pulling over it. Water to me in that environment and steam in that environment would only keep us from doing that as quickly and as, and as well as we have. You can see the color on that product is a good dark mahogany color. The, the bark is set on there really well. And now it's time for a wet mop. You can add flavor with a wet mop. In this case, I'm using a, a, a marinade that has um, some soy sauce and Worcester and things like that in it. And it'll darken that bark. But that wet mop will keep these edges and little corners from burning now. The bark is set. 
it's okay to spray something like this on there to keep it uh, from, from burning and to add some flavor. So that's why I, I talk on and on about a dry cooking environment, yet I use a wet mop after the bark is set. I know that might sound uh, uh, against the reasoning that I've used in, in the past, but that dry cooking environment is what got us there. So those, there's our fire, and I'm going to always add enough wood to keep that temperature going. You'll get a feel for how much wood it takes to keep your pit, pit going. It, it only takes cooking on it once or twice before you'll master that. That's all we're doing here. We're watching that thermometer and keeping it at 250 to 275 in this case between the two. Uh, and that's going to give us an average cooking temperature on the left of 250 and on the right of 275. And the bologna's done. We've got plenty of bark on there. You can see how that spice rub makes a really attractive bark on the outside. And the scoring allowed the bologna to open up without tearing or breaking. Uh, I, I use a dry rub on bologna because I like the way it adds a kind of a crunchy exterior to it like this. Uh, but you can see we've gotten a lot of smoke adhesion on here. That's a really good bark. Uh, and that'll be, that'll be some good bologna. Plate ribs also have gotten a good bark. We're going to leave them on there a little longer and make sure we got, we have, uh, plenty of bark set on there and plenty of smoke. But the bologna always is, is done earlier. Of course, it's a pre-cooked product. The last thing we'll be doing, you can see my temperature here is about 155 in the center of these beef ribs. These beef ribs have, let's see if I can get better focus. It's very difficult. There we go. Uh, you can see all this crust is formed. We're starting to see liquid pool up on the outside. There is nothing more that can happen in this smoker, in my opinion. At this point, you have lots of good bark on here, lots of good crust, lots of smoke adhesion. Your dry rub is set into a good hard bark. It's time for a braise. You could braise them in the smoker by wrapping them with foil and putting them back in there. Or you could do what I'm going to do, take them out, take them inside, wrap them in foil, and put them in the oven. Um, doesn't matter if you, have a, if you have an electric smoker or a, an outdoor oven, like an electric smoker, you can use an outdoor oven, you can do it out there. You could, like I said, you could leave them in the pit and do it, but I don't like to waste wood and charcoal when I can just throw them in the oven at this point. That is the basics of smoker management. Um, you light it with a charcoal chimney and some lighter fluid and, and put some chunks of wood on top of that charcoal chimney so they can preheat and get where they're burning really, really hot. And you dump it all in the, in the firebox and let your temperature come up, add a few more pieces and wait until you have a nice clean blue thin smoke like that and then just add wood periodically whenever your uh your thin blue smoke is coming out of there like that that is nice and and clean and you'll know what to look for now uh then you just keep your temperature at that temperature the whole time it's it's really there's not much more to it than that um and then pull your products off when you're supposed to but this is all about fire management and about barbecue pit management in this case i did it on a small offset it works the same way on a large trailer smoker. It works the same way on a big green egg. Once you have your good, clean fire going, it's just it's just about figuring out how much fuel will keep that, that temperature constant and then enjoying your day in barbecue. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Thanks.